That's what I just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on down, Judge. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we run on time. Okay. <laughs> As you heard with the other respective departments, the question this year is it's a little different from, from prior years. With the understanding of the status quo recommended budget, if you could provide uh, what that entails as it relates to the operations of your respective departments. And just for the viewing audience, if you can provide a brief synopsis of the services that you provide for the city. Just want to let the city know, um, or the viewing audience know that this is a joint uh, between the juvenile court and the juvenile clerk's office as well. And the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll go first and hand over to Judge Calloway momentarily. Uh, she'll be a little longer than I am, so I'll just kind of sit back and observe myself. Um, thank you for having us here today, Budget Finance Committee members and Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm David Smith, the Juvenile Court Clerk in Davidson County. With me, as I mentioned a moment ago, is Judge Sheila Calloway, the Juvenile Court Judge for the uh, system here in Nashville. We, the Clerk's Office, can operate within the Mayor's proposed uh, status quo budget. Um, our office, the uh, synopsis of our office is we are the keeper of all the records uh, that pass through the juvenile system. The majority of our revenue is generated through uh, petition filing through child support services and those petitions that come across the counter from attorneys and private individuals. We also do all the collection of fines and costs and restitution payments set forth by the juvenile court in our bookkeeping area. We um, also staff nine courtrooms with um, a clerk for each magistrate and the judge herself and soon to be a 10th uh, division of the juvenile court that she'll get into and allude, I'll uh, let her talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> also in our duties at our office, we, um, we handle bank accounts funds for um, awards, uh, money awarded by the state of Tennessee to uh, victim, what's called victim's comp accounts for uh, minors who have uh, had something happen in their life and the state awards money to them and it's our job as an office to be the overseer of that um, funding until that child reaches the uh, age of 18 at which time we will notify the child six months normally prior to their 18th birthday that we have funds available for them to file a motion to get before the judge to have that money dispersed to them. Uh, this was, um, this morning, um, our numbers were right at 250 bank accounts and uh, a little over $1.8 million that we're overseeing currently. Uh, this was um, something back in 2010 that when we took office, if you, some of you may I don't know if you were in this room at that time or not, but um, the former council, uh, we were excited at that time because when we came in office, we found 74 cases that had aged out, two of which were 31 years old, uh, a couple of 29s on down into the early 20s, and we were able to locate 67 of those 74 cases and shelled out about $235,000 on February of 2011 to uh, uh, the recipients of that money, most of which didn't know that they had that money sitting in juvenile court. So we were proud of that fact in 2010 when we were able to do that. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned by the other two offices before us uh, about the electronic filing, that is our uh, number one priority right now to uh, get that implemented. Of course, it's, uh, it was the PIP money that was awarded a year and a half ago um, for the criminal court clerk, circuit court clerk, and the juvenile court clerk to uh, be able to implement e-filing. And um, of course, we being the smaller of the three offices got pushed back to the back burner. But as Mr. Sloss mentioned a few minutes ago, that is probably a good thing because Mr. Rooker's office will have to get all the 
kinks worked out, and then Mr. Gentry's office with Julius will have to uh, work out the splinters, and then hopefully ours will just be smooth sailing when we when we get it. We just don't know when it's coming. But we've been meeting on that regularly with uh, Tiberia and Conduit and having uh, web meetings, and, and uh, it, it won't be under my watch, but it will happen hopefully in the next uh, 18 months, as, as mentioned. Uh, we'll be able to get that um, implemented. Um, <clears throat> as most of you probably know, this uh, is my last uh, budget hearing uh, before I uh, go Thursday morning of this week to sign my retirement papers. Um, so August 31st at 430 will be my last day and hour and minute. I'm going to walk out with my staff at, on a Friday afternoon. It happens to fall on uh, at 430 that afternoon. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity, if I could, just for a moment to thank the entire Metro Council, uh, this body, and the three administrations that I've worked under for their help and support uh, since I've been in office since 2010. Um, it's just one of those where you, you, you know you're going to leave somebody out, but, uh, you know, Talia and, and Tony and the finance department have been just uh, been great to us. I mean, when we ask for within consideration, ask for uh, things. They've, they've all seem to have always come through for us. JIS has been over zealous. I mean, they've just been done, they've done everything for us that we could ever ask. Um, you know, back in 2010, we went through a major flood when my campaign was um, two days away from taking place. The floods hit. They postponed the camp, the election for two weeks, if you remember. So when I actually won the election and took office, we were displaced and five locations around the city uh, as far as the Ben West Library and back back over here to the historic courthouse and uh, everywhere in between Metro Southeast we uh, we were kind of working out of five different locations and we were still able to uh, implement scanning immediately with the help of this Metro Council appropriating the money for that we were able to scan 160,000 files uh, that were flooded and get them back to uh, back to a, a, a state where that if that ever happened again or a fire or any major disaster took place that we would we would have a backup of some sort and we were able to do that in the first six months of office and and got moved back in in March uh, 11th of 2011 at the same time we completed the 160,000 file scanning project so that was one of our major accomplishments that we've done in the last eight seven and a half years um, and as Bill Garrett said yesterday, sitting here, um, because he was on his last one as well, he um, couldn't have done any of this without his staff. And we have a exceptional, exceptional staff um, in the juvenile court clerk's office. And, um, you know, I, that, that's going to be the hardest part is just leaving the staff and, and knowing the hard work and dedication that they have to keeping things on time and on track and uh, petitions come in daily from the child support services and and we get them out the same day and I've heard horror stories how they used to stack up on desk and lay there for weeks before they would ever get processed and I know these things go out daily um, and it's it's just amazing to see these people work and I I just hope and pray that each one of them gets an opportunity and I know Mr. Lionel Matthews back here our newly elected juvenile court clerk is going to meet with each one of them individually and give them an opportunity to prove their self and I think everything's going to be fine and he and I've discussed this and he's coming over tomorrow and we're going over a few other things so I just want everyone to know that the transition of the juvenile court clerk's office is going to be smooth uh, our door will always be open throughout the summer for uh, Mr. Matthews and his transition team to um, come in step in check out the operations, whatever they need to see and do and learn before he takes office on September 4th, on Tuesday after Labor Day, um, officially on September 1st. I also have to, uh, if I could, just mention Julius Sloss, who sat up here with Mr. Gentry a few minutes ago. Julius and I go back 35 years. Um, he was working for the, my, um, the uh, current, or excuse me, the former uh, juvenile court clerk when I came into office and he stayed with me and has stuck with me for seven and a half years and had an opportunity to go with Mr. Gentry when Alfred DeGraffenried left and 
and Julius took that opportunity and I don't blame him. So uh, we have been uh, just kind of pulling together down in the court, down in the clerk's office to make up for his absence um, currently until Mr. Matthews and I dis discuss what he, his plan is for that position. But um, Julius, thank you for everything you've always done. He is, uh, Julius, you know, was my budget analyst down in the office and, um, you know, he's sticking by here for a few minutes with me because uh, he helped prepare this budget uh, before uh, Mr. Gentry left or before he went to work with Mr. Gentry. So with that, uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. I got to thank my wife too. I told her I would. So <laughs> I can't, yeah. Well, if I'd done that, man, I'd really been in trouble when I got home. So thank my wife for uh, always being there for me and uh, helping me through this whole process, campaigning and uh, office and everything. And that's about all I've got. And I'll answer any questions or turn it over to Judge Callaway. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just have to um, reiterate everything that David Smith has just said. It has been truly a joy to work with him. Um, when I came in as the newly elected um, juvenile court judge, um, he made the transition so easy for me. He was always there to help. He was always there to give advice. Um, we've never had an opportunity to even disagree about anything. We've worked together um, tremendously over the last four years, and I get teary every time I talk about it, but <laughs> I'm not going to get teary again, but I truly am going to miss him, um, and um, it's just been wonderful. Don't you start. It's been a wonderful time with him. I'm looking forward to working with um, newly elected um, clerk, Lionel Matthews. I mean, I'm definitely going to miss David, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you've done. Um, all right, I'm back together. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say I am Sheila Calloway, the juvenile court judge, and we in juvenile court handle all of matters concerning um, children and youth and their families in our community. Um, about a third of the cases that we handle deal with children who are neglected, dependent, or abused. About a third of the can um, um, cases that we handle deal with parentage issues from custody, parenting time, um, child support, and all those issues as well. And the final third of the, the um, cases that we handle deal with juveniles, whether it's delinquency or status offenses, um, um, truancy, educational neglect, and in those sections of, of the um, cases. Uh, we do a lot of work, uh, have an absolutely amazing staff that work tremendously hard each and every day. And um, I cannot thank them enough for all the work that ha they have done. Um, for our children who are in the system as neglect and dependency, um, the services that we provide, we basically um, we have a team that does helps to process the petitions, um, works with the Department of Children's Services. We make sure that we have a robust foster care review board team um, who's making sure that children who are in DCS custody are getting all the services that they need. Um, we are excited. We just got a grant from the Department of Children's Services or State of Tennessee um, in order to have continue our work with the um, Safe Babies Court, where we will be dedicating services for um, children, babies who are removed from their families between, are at risk of being removed from their families between zero and three years old. And we are just hired a brand new magistrate, part-time magistrate to handle those cases. And that's Mr. Reese Glanton. And uh, we will be in the process of hiring a um, Safe Babies Court coordinator um, in the next couple of weeks as well so that the Safe Babies Court will be up and running soon. We already have one that was run by another agency, but this money is coming directly to us um, for us to run through the, the state. Um, for our parentage courts, we do a lot of work with parentage, especially the uh, non-custodial parents. Um, we have a parental assistance court, and they work with the non-custodial parents in order to remove any barriers that they have from making having a relationship with their child, as well as for paying child support. Um, and in the last, um, when we as we are working on removing those barriers in 2015, we were able to collect about 60,000, over 60,000 in child support monies for the 
to make sure that they went where they go. And in 2017, we increased that money um, to about 167,000. And so our our um, parents parental assistance court are working tirelessly to make sure that we are connecting our um, youth, our children with their families and their non-custodial parents and that they're really having an active life with them. Um, we have a lot of new initiatives as well for our um, delinquency and um, status offense cases. Um, over the last years, we have, for di we have diverted over 3,400 cases from the formal prosecution and done a diversion system and informal adjustments where we do assessments on all these children and we um, recommend services for them. Of those children that have gone over the 3,400 that have gone through the system, we have less than a 7% of them have come back for formal adjudication on a later delinquent offense. So we have done a tremendous job on recidivism rates. And so that's less, that's less than 7% are coming back into the system again, and we're very proud of that number. Um, we also um, have increased our numbers of um, youth that are going through our youth court system. Um, we now have six schools that we're operating, and we're hoping to add an additional number of schools. Of those cases, since um, 2016, we had about 239 youth that their cases were heard by our youth court. Of those, only 98 or 98% of those had never come back to our system again. And again, this is at less than a 2% um, recidivism rate for youth who go through the youth court system is um, amazing, and we're very excited about that. We've trained this past year over 200 students um, to be a part of youth court, and that encourages them to um, consider um, jobs in the law, and, um, and it definitely encourages them to stay out of trouble. Uh, we have improved our um, numbers with our Metro Student Attendance Center, where we work directly with the school system as well as the um, police department and making sure that um, our kids that are loitering during school hours are um, being brought to our center and having services presented to them to make sure that they are staying in school. And we have been working closely with Bishop Marcus Campbell and the gang program with our gang resistance intervention program. And over the past year, we've worked with over 50 youth and 35 of them have graduated from the um, GRIP court system. And so we are doing a lot of work and we're excited about the work that we are doing. Um, I think the question that the council um, um, chair asked about would we be able to, with the um, budget that was presented, would, be, would we be able to um, operate? Um, we will have a little difficulty with operations with the suggested budget increase, particularly in the position of the detention cost. And if I can explain to you how the detention cost works, um, we have a contract with a facility called um, Youth Opportunity Investments. We've had that contract since 2015. When we started this contract, we contracted for bed numbers, and so we have a solid rate that we pay for 32 beds, um, for, for 32 kids to be in beds. Um, anything over that, we pay an additional cost for all of the youth over that. When we did the contract back in 2015, we did a, a comprehensive study of the trends at that time, and we were never over 32, and so we thought 32 was a good number, and we were hoping that that would last. Um, unfortunately, as you may know, um, youth crime did go up, it spiked in 2017, and because of that, um, the average bed space in 2017 spiked up to 41 beds, and so we were having to pay an overage um, for the extra beds. Um, particularly in 2018, it spiked up between um, starting in February of 2018 and going to uh, the end of April of 2018. The average beds that we were using were 52 on average. There were 52 youth in our detention facility. We believe that that's directly connected to the Metro National Public Police Department's effort with the Youth Crime Task Force. 
Um, they've done great work. Um, they've had over 68 arrests of juveniles. Um, they've confiscated over 56 weapons and some other drugs and other things. Um, but the flip side of that is because of all of the increase in rest, um, there is a need for us to um, house them in our detention facility until we either adjudicate their cases, find appropriate placements for them in the community with services or in the Department of Children's Services. So because of that, the cost of our detention um, is um, over what we had budgeted. And the increase that we are asking for and that we, we feel that we need is, um, the, is would be the 496 thousand dollars versus the 250,000 that was requested or suggested by um, the um, OMB office. Um, I will say the reason for that, that what we need is, and we've been talking to the office for a while about this issue. Um, if the trend looks like we're averaging about 48 youth, and I'm not sure if that's going to go down anytime soon. And um, what we would like to do and what we have suggested is to do a new contract with the facility instead of doing the 32 beds to do 48 beds. And so that would be, be the cost of the overage that we are asking for. Um, if we do that, then we're ensuring that they have enough staff um, to take care of the youth that are in our detention facilities, that um, they're you know, currently they're unfortunately doing a lot of overtime because they've only staffed for 32 kids. And so that means that they have to do overtime with the staff that they have. And um, we, we just think that it's necessary for us to, in, to be able to do a new contract for a 48 bed facility versus the 32. Um, other than that, we are operating under our budget. Um, all of our other operation um, expenses are down. We would love to thank the um, Talia and Tony and Richie for all the work that they've done with us over the past year. They've been super helpful, um, especially working, trying to figure out the best way to move forward with our um, overage on our detention cost. I think that's all we have for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Judge Calloway. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, the $250,000 increase uh, with respect to the de detention center, is that what you were referring to uh, earlier in your comments about the beds? Yes, sir. All right. And help me understand what the, I, I think you might have taken a stab at it, and I might be a little thick-headed. <laughs> the uh, cost escalator, uh, help me understand how that works. So when we did, I, and I did not say this, um, Councilman Pulley, earlier, and I apologize. When we did the right? original contract, there was um, negotiated a 3% um, cost improvement each year. And so part of that was already part of the negotiations that we would give them 3% more than what we gave them the last time. But what we're asking for instead of the 3% is to renegotiate to do a 48 beds. And so for this year, the 3% cost escalation would not be in there. Instead, it would be a 48 bed contract instead. Okay, thank you. Um, and it certainly sounds reasonable to me. Uh, another thing, youth violence is just, uh, uh, in my estimation, one of the things that we really need to wrap our arms around with uh, as much as possible. Your name is certainly synonymous with restorative justice practices, and I'm sure, uh, uh, and you've done great work in that area, and I know it's a very difficult balance to strike between that and accountability for some of these things, and uh, we've s certainly seen a spike in my district, and over the city, which led to uh, the task force that you really sp spoke to, and uh, the task force has done great work. Uh, it looks like you've got a $200,000 allocation here for youth violence, and I'd like to you to speak to us about uh, what that money would be used for and uh, uh, anything else that we can help with regard to that particular issue, which is troubling to all of us. Absolutely, and, and we are definitely working hard on um, eradicating youth violence, and, and we know that it's an issue in all communities. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to see Don Diener and Glenn Funk here as well. Um, they have been instrumental along with um, Chief Anderson and Gordon Howie uh, 
um, working with us in order to have an actual restorative justice program that they will be starting their first cases in June is my understanding. They're going through their last, there's a organization that's working to do the restorative justice for court and um, they are going through their last stages of training and should be ready to go. Um, as to the community partnership fund, um, we've had a, a committee of folks that um, um, got together, worked with the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth and other place and other agencies that are recommending um, those funds to be um, sent to different agencies to do um, programs that are evidence-based um, that um, are going to help us to eradicate some of the issues with youth violence. Um, the recommendations have been submitted and um, I don't know exactly which ones and organizations that um, are going to be selected from that, um, but we're looking forward to really working with the different communities that um, hopefully get some of the money for these funds and are able to use them. So this will be disseminated to other organizations. Is that what that's designated for? That's correct. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Pulley. Judge, I want to go to the 3% the cost improvement each year. So the minimum as it relates to the beds is 32. If just, just hypothetically, if it was to remain at 32, year after year after year, are we still paying that 3% or is it 3% over the 32 year after year? So the 3%, the 32 is for the number of beds that we would pay for. for so we're paying at a flat rate for 32 kids to be held in our detention facility. And so the 3% is on top of, in, in, in addition to? Design. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I, and I think I made a mistake. I think my um, wonderful administration staff, uh, Kathy Sinbag, Jim Swack, and Tommy Bradley, who are in here are throwing up signs to me, and I will safely say they are not gang signs, but I believe that the contracted number of beds, I, I misspoke, is not 48, but it's 40, that we're asking for a contract for 40 beds. Thank you for that clarification. I was wondering who negotiated the contract, but thank you for that clarification with that. Councilman Shulman. Oh. I was just going to add, as there are a number of um, the reason they, they, they have to be in a denomination of eight because of the federal laws of how many children you can have per staff. And so that's why it goes from 32 to 40 or to 48 um, because of the federal guidelines of what has to be um, the ratio for staff to children. Thank you so much, Judge. Vice Chair Schulman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Judge. Um, uh, just following up on Councilman Pulley's um, discussion on the Community Partnership Fund, it, that's that's new money that's coming in that's then going to be sent through your through the court and then distributed to local groups. Is that and it's designed to try to deal with youth violence? Is that Absolutely. It? Okay. Absolutely, and we're picking the the local groups to have. There's a a, a very um, um, extensive. Um, list of qualifications that these groups have to have in order for us to be able to disseminate the money to them. Um, it has to be evidence-based. They have to have some type of um, mentorship, fellowship after they're working with the children. There has to be um, proof that the programs that they're using have worked previously. And there's a number of lists of qualifications that um, each of the organizations have to have for us in order to use those. Have we, have we done anything like this before in terms of trying to get money out? To I will say through the um, through our office, we have not, and that's, okay. it, this was in a suggestion from the mayor's office previously that we work together and figure out the best way that we can use the organizations that we have in our community in order to really help eradicate the youth violence. So we're looking forward to. We think it's an exciting idea. We think that it will give um, other agencies an opportunity to be at the table to really help us to uh, improve our programs. Okay. And uh, Mr. Smith, I just. Um um, just wanted to say thank you. Um, I think, um, obviously, Mr. Garrett was here yesterday. We, um, we appreciate um, the service that you put into the city. Um, you've done good. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for everything. Appreciate it. Thank you. Don't make him cry, Vice Chair. I, <laughs> I was working on it. <laughs> I'm going to lay it on him later. Okay. Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Vercher. Uh, Judge Calloway, can I inquire back to the um, detention contract? 
Um, you said that the spike between February and April related to the Juvenile Crime Task Force, you were averaging the need for 52 beds. Um, you'd already kind of seen an uptick to 41 beds in 2017. So I understand now you've sort of revised to say the new contract you hope to negotiate is 40 beds. But then I also heard you say that, um, I guess you had asked through the budgeting process initially um, for 496,000. That is it, correct, Council. So, um, but then um, our receiving here budgeted 250K. Um, I guess just based on trends you're seeing 2017 in, in an ideal world, where, where would this be, be falling? You know, in an ideal world, the trends that we're seeing, um, the prevention work that we're doing on the front end, um, such as the youth core at the Metro Student Attendance Center, um, our, our hope is and our belief is if we continue to do the prevention work that those numbers will eventually start coming back down again. I would be happy to say that I looked at our detention roster today before I came over here and today we're at 41. Um, so that that's a much, much better number. Um, than last week we were not, but today we are. Okay, so then um, the decision uh, 40 versus 48, I mean, that's, it's, it's a cost decision then, not necessarily related to, I mean, based on need right now, you'd probably be at 48. If we, so. if we had to do it based on need right at this moment, it would be 48, okay. which would be even more than the 496. And we, we understand the issues of um, the finance and the money that we, we're facing as a, as a community. And so we're trying to be as um, fiscally sound as we can, um, trying to do the best that we can on the prevention and literally looking at each one of those children that are coming through and seeing how fast we can get services set up. You know, hopefully with these community funds and the other agencies, the restorative justice, that will help to alleviate some of the youth that are staying in detention and will be able to provide better services for them out in the community. So that's our ideal hope. Understood, right. And and, and for that to kind of uh, take hold in, in, in time and over the next few years, hopefully as, as soon as possible. So I appreciate that work. Um, I, I just wonder if uh, from a you know, contract standpoint, it looks like that, you know, we did incur quite a lot of cost previously because we were at that uh, 30 bed number, or rather, I guess, 32 bed number. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the balance of, you know, fiscal and ideal and so forth, but do you, I mean, do we have concerns that we go with the 40, I mean, what were, would happen if we were to go with the 40 bed renegotiated contract and then sadly, we, we held in this sort of 48, 50-ish space. I mean, we would not then have gone through the process to renegotiate a contract only just to incur the same I, extra I, cost. Yes, I understand that you're, what your argument it is. And I really do think that it's starting to level out okay. now. And um, I will say with the task force and the work that they've done, and they've partnered with our gang unit, our um, um, probation, I think I'm hopeful that the numbers of youth who are um, being subjected to this um, system that way are definitely leveling off. So yes, it is a, a hopeful wish. Um, and I definitely understand on the business side that it um, seems like we should probably go up to the 48 um, so that we're not going to be overage. Um, but I, I do feel strongly that if we stick at 40, that we probably will not have as many of the overage problems as we're having now. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you, Council Lady Henderson. Seeing no other council members seeking recognition, and just one last time, David, thank you so much uh, for your service to the city. Um, on a personal note for me, um, you were one of my supporters when I was an infant um, in this space. <laughs> Many of us in this chamber also, you've always been so encouraging, so positive, and I just wish you the best in, in this next chapter of your life. Thank you so much.